All right, I want to say uh, ETM Hotep, which means welcome in peace. I want to welcome everyone to our YouTube channel, Seshu Ma'ani Medonetcher YouTube channel. Really appreciate uh, all those who are tuned in and who will be tuned in and those who will be watching the video from the archives. Uh, this is your brother, Wajau Minib Erima'at. And tonight, we're going to give a uh, presentation, a uh, sonnet. Emiket Aku Kinshai will be presenting um, a presentation entitled Wine Labeling in Ancient Egypt, a lesson in reading hieratic jar labels. All right. Um, but before we get into that, I uh, just wanted to uh, say a few things and also allow people to kind of tune in who will be uh, joining us. Um, if you're uh, watching and you know you you know someone who may be interested in the subject matter or anything, please share the video and make sure you subscribe. And also, after you subscribe, make sure you hit the bell so you can be notified when we're live or when we upload uh, different videos. And we'll be doing more videos um, a little more frequently uh, than we've been. Uh, we've kind of taken a, a break for a while. Uh, we were kind of going hard for a, a whole year. You know, with Divine Words Wednesdays, Freestyle Fridays, uh, Welcome to Sub Subite Dome. Uh, then we decided to take a break uh, from that. And we're just getting everything revved up and geared up um, to bring forth, you know, some more information and share information. And really to interact with, with people so that we all can learn. You know, we're all in this together. We have a lot to learn about the Nile Valley, about Africa, African history uh, in general. But, you know, our focus is on the east uh africa in the nile valley and kemet specifically so we deal with um all aspects uh, of kemet uh the language the culture writing system uh you name it so there's a lot to learn um there's a lot to actually correct because there's a lot of information out there but there's good information and then there's misinformation and we have to be able to discern between the two and so we uh, want to become proficient in the tools that allow us to know or that allows us to discern, you know, fact from fiction, truth from falsehoods. And so there's a lot. There's a lot of work to be done. And so we don't get uh, involved with a lot of um, things that may hinder that progress. You know, sometimes we have to address uh, claims that are made. And we, we do that under the um, Sabait Dome series. Uh, you know, claims that kind of matter, you know, because a lot of people make claims about different things uh, involving Kemet. And, you know, we just can't address everything. And some things are not pretty much not worth addressing. Um, so we choose which ones to address or, or to uh, speak on and everything. Um, also, we have a, a Facebook group. Uh, under the same name, Seshu Mani Medonetra, where we have a lot of a lot more frequent uh, conversations, sharing of information, people chiming in, um, uh, topic posts are posted, questions are asked, answers are given, you know, research. Uh, it's a very good environment. Uh, if you would like to join, just join. We'll accept your uh, membership into the group and just, um, you know, come in, share information, have questions. Feel free to ask. All right. Um, we do a lot of Facebook Live. Um, I do a lot of Facebook Lives on my uh, on my account uh, on Facebook, uh, addressing some of these issues or a lot of posts that I will put up. Um, I will address you know different topics or you know um, kind of change the narrative and 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 cause people to think you know and deal with critical thinking. I may question things that we may not have really thought about issues that we may not have thought about some things that we say and repeat just for the sake of re repeating it and not really giving any thought or revisiting different topics so um so that's what takes place uh, on my timeline so uh feel free to to send me a friend request um my screen name is wujau on facebook you send me a, a friend request and you know so we can keep up with each other interact uh, with no problem all right so we want to get into tonight's presentation so uh, now before we do that uh, 
we are accustomed to reciting the offering formula and so we will do just that this is an offering formula this is a generic offering formula um, that we recommend people to memorize uh, for several reasons one it it is um, a good opener for you know any endeavors that you're doing it's kind of sets the tone uh, for you to kind of include um, the ancestors you know it, it basically puts you in the mode of of its anti uh, solo exclusion ism because you know we tend to do things in our own head we think in our own heads and we do things that please us according to us the way we want everything but when you open up and keep it in mind of a larger collective whether they're um, alive or deceased it kind of puts you in in the awareness that you're not alone and that you're doing things in connection uh, interrelated interconnected with other things that's the general principle and so in the Yoruba tradition uh, or you know a lot of African traditions they will uh, pour libations and things uh, so this can serve as an addition or a substitute for that uh, just a recitation of an offering formula all right so what you see is on the screen is the offering formula and I'll just recite it and uh, read the translation Hotep di Nasu Waser Neb Jadu Necha A Neb Abju Di F Peret Kheru Tihen Ket Ka Apet Seshmin Ket Ket Nebet Neferet Wabet Anket Necha M In Kani Imaku Aku Makeru And what that says is an offering in which the king gives Waser O Osiris, Lord of Jadu, the great God, Lord of Abydos, so that he may give verbal offerings in beer, bread, ox, fowl, alabaster, and linen, everything good and pure on which a god lives, for the ka of the revered ones, the ancestors who are justified. And so when you memorize this, or when you say it for yourself, the word aku in the last line, where you see in kani imaku aku, makeru, the word aku, you would simply substitute that for a person's name or several names. Uh, whether they're um, you know deceased loved ones or whomever you just replace the names there all right in the last line and then that's it so um, this is recommended to practice it has a little cadence to it to easy memorize and also you can study the glyphs and the transliterations and the translation all right okay so with that being said again I want to say ETM Hotep and welcome to everyone uh, and Afterwards, hopefully, we will take some questions and answers as well. So, I think I've done enough talking, and I will, uh, at this moment, pass the mic on to our beloved sonnet sister, uh, Amy Keraku Kinshai Akinyi. All right, um, Dua. So, yes, um, I just like to say, um, ETM Hotep. And um, my name is uh, Imiket Aku. Can you show your can you could just shorten it to Imiket or Imiket Aku? And um, today I'm going to do a presentation on um, wine labeling in ancient Egypt. And um, this is going to be so, sort of um, an introduction to um, reading erratic jar labels. And um, um, you know when we when we discuss um, erratic or what we know as simple one of the simplified um such nature script it can get um a little bit um intimidating um for people because um it's not really the formal sesh that we see and you know the one that we recognize the you know the 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 pictorials for so it, not a lot of people would um you know jump uh, readily jump into into reading or, or translating the script but um we're going to be using jar labels to kind of go over it to or into use it as a stepping stone to kind of dive deep into um, heretic and um the reason why i chose this is because um the the jar labels are actually um the simple and uh, it's, um short inscriptions so you find like two two lines and then um they follow a certain um structure that um when that can be easily recognizable 
and then that will kind of help us um go you know start recognizing different glyphs so um you know it won't be that difficult but um some of the things that um that makes a uh, hieratic a little bit different or simplified such a little bit di- uh, difficult is um the fact that it's not really difficult but what makes what might um kind of make people hesitant into getting into it is the fact that like i said they can't recognize the the glyphs this more abstract um characters that we that we that we look at and the fact that um their handwritten so changes from um scribe to scribe and also um the there's also changes that we see through different um dynasties or kingdoms uh, within the script itself and also the fact that um the the hieratic signs also include what is known as ligatures so most of the times we'll see um two glyphs that are combined together joined together and this is something that we are familiar with in cursive um handwriting but it can get a little bit difficult but hopefully um you know once we finish with this presentation then um you know it won't be it won't seem that difficult and you'll see like um if most people would be encouraged to get into into uh reading or translating hieratic signs but um so we're looking at wine labels and but before we go into ancient egypt um, i think the best thing to do is to kind of look at um our modern modern um labeling in uh, on the on the wine bottles that we know and um i know most people probably have bought um some wine or you know seen different ones at the supermarket and aisles or, or different stores and uh, we see the labels and most of the time we don't pay so much attention to what um those labels um include but the um the the labeling follows the certain criteria the certain uh, rules and or laws and regulations that must be met and um normally we'll see that um some of the things that must be included on the on the on the wine bottles that we see is something like um classification where the uh, we, you know it, the the label will tell us what type of wine we're looking at and then we'll see the vintage or of the year of production and uh, mostly um that most of the time will probably dictate the price of the wine as well and then uh you see the amount and the amount will um include the the net weight and the uh, alcohol content and then you see also the location and the place of production and um you know some people might um have a preference for uh for example french wine or some people might have a preference for italian wine and all those they will be looking at the labels and, and things like that and um some of the other things that might not see on the screen but usually um should also be included is if there's any health and warning statements and so forth so these are the um type of things that um producers of wine um of, of wine would probably have to adhere to and um you know we're not uh, most of the time we see this and we don't know how far this um tradition goes back to and uh, <clears throat> in this presentation we're going to be going as far back as kemet and um when we look at on uh, on the wine jars um from ancient kemet uh this these actually the wines were um stored in um, forests or, or jars and um the wines that were stored in there the labeling of those um jar of, of those jars were um the task of labeling them was left to the scribes and they did that as a means to manage and to control the supply of wine and um the labels are not it's not very um intricate per se and let me see if i can get my cursor going over here so this is um this is a picture of um if you if you see the picture on your right side plus um it, uh the picture has the inscriptions of a uh, wine label a wine label so those are written in hieratic text and um what is done is that usually um when you look at different um inscript or different jar labels or wine jar labels you find there's um pretty much four sets of information that you 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 pretty much um expect to see there sometimes there might be um other other details uh, that are included but um it follows a very um stereotypical um or or a very um structured um you know um uh, steps or sets of information that you see and the first one that um you see will be the vintage year just like we saw on the other modern wine that we have here we have um the vintage year over here so you see the vintage year and then you'd see um the particular product or the designation of the product and it will tell you what product sometimes it might tell you what type or uh, the type or uh, the quality uh, or the use of of that particular wine 
and then you see the name and place of production and then um, you would also expect to see ownership or uh, some kind of authorization or signature by a responsible um, official and um, yeah so those those four sets of information you expect to see them and um, and and we see them also in like like a, like I showed in the other um, slide you'll see them also in the modern on the modern uh, wine bottles but you are also expected to see those on the wine jars even if you're going to be translating you those you'll definitely find there and so um, for the next part of the presentation we're just going to be breaking down these um, four sets of information how to identify them what to expect from them so on the next slide we're going to start with the vintage year and I hope I am not going so fast if you have any questions um, I'll definitely look at them later but yeah so on on the first um the first set of information that you expect to see will be the vintage and um that will be the year of production and this for the most part um is always at the beginning of the text and um obviously there's there's small exceptions but um they're pretty much very rare um and the other thing that just to note um i know that when we um translate some text we always see the year attached to a particular king but uh when reading the these labels the year is not attached to to any particular king per se and i'm not sure if this is because the wines weren't expected to be to last for uh hundreds of years or whatever but they're not attached to any king and then um sometimes you might see a year and then you see uh, the month included and the season but uh more, for the most part you will just see the year so what you see is um this is the Haradic um, glyphs or the text for the the, white, the year, which is um, known as Hatsep. And uh, over here, I've included the, the formal search for those who are not able to recognize this. But really what you see here is um is a palm branch. These are three different sets. You can see how they differ depending on the scribe that was um, doing that or writing. So you see the palm branch. And then here you see this will be the raised bread loaf, and then it is um, it is um, combined using a ligature. It's combined with the threshing floor, so that would be hatseb, which means um, regnal year or just simply year. And attached to that year would be a number, so you'll see a numerical number. And um, here is some generic numbers that you see probably mostly from the Middle Kingdom um, hieratic writing. But these are the these are the numbers that you would see attached to to a particular year. So, for example, um, if you have a, um, a you know you're trying to write the year seventeen, so you would see something like um, this, where you have um, the year. So this would be Hatsep, and then you'd have um, the number seventeen. And to write number seventeen, you have the number ten here, and then you have the number seven. And um, if I go back here, this is the number 10. Um, that's the number 10. And then the number seven is right here. So that would be the number. Um, so that would be the year 17. Let's say you were right, you wanted to write the num the year 40. So you would probably use it. So you not probably, you would definitely use this glyph. And, then, and that would be 40. If you were to write 45, you'd use, you would use this glyph. And then you would use that glyph. So in this case, you would have uh, the word Hatsep and then the, the two glyphs for 40 and for the, for the number five to represent the year 45. So that's the first um, information that you see on the wine jar. It's usually um, in the beginning of the, of the text. Um, and then the next set of information you see is the product. And this is where um, you have a description of the product. Um, and uh, for the most part, you see the word Irep which means wine. And um, this is the, the Habatic uh, glyphs form. I have three examples over here. Um, so that would be Irep, which is wine. Some jar labels you, you'll see with the word Shedech, which means uh, pomegranate wine um, as well. So those would be the two types of wine. And then combined with that, you will see um, sometimes um, what is mentioned will be the quality of that particular wine. So you expect to see the glyphs for the word Nefer, which means good so it would be good wine or it could be very very good wine which would be nefer nefer or it could be sweet wine which would be nejem or nefer nejem for good and sweet and then um some wines will be um labeled uh, depending on the use on what type of um, use they will be for so you'd see a wine like um labeled irup and hebu 
which be would be wine of the day and then some of them will be high nefer which would be uh, for festivity wine and then you have irak ma'a for offering wine and you know like you see on offering formulas and then you see you have um shedder and wenem which would be dinner wine and then you have um other um other artifacts where you might find um the wine being um labeled as our merge and um that literally means um part of a tenth so those would be probably for taxation i don't know if actually this is where the tenth come from but hey so that would be um a tenth and then you have um in it or and that will probably be donations or gifts so you'd have wines that were offered as as gifts as well so those would be um some of the the glyphs or some of the the phrases that you find to, that describes the particular wine and um its quality or its use so um over here so i have um the two sets of information we had four four sets of information but uh, where we had um the 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 year or uh, of the vintage and then we had and we had the product um and then we had the place of production and then we had ownership of or authorization and we've looked at the first two so um um but over here we have um the second one that we looked at which was um the product we have um wine it says wine and then sometimes it would give it the quality like i said and you'd have nefer nefer so this will be good wine this is the hat and wind pipe um two hat and wind pipes which you uh, give it nefer nefer and then you have the three strokes and this will be irap with the reed leaf the mouth the mat and then you have a jack and i think this will be the three the three strokes boy um um when it's i think from the faxing faxing it would look like like a uh, 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 you know a word of report but so with those set, two sets of information um if we look at um one of the inscriptions it's a facsimile um of of an inscription that's found on a jar um or a broken shard and i think some of the information is missing but we have those two sets of information and pretty much that's what we've gone through um right now so this is where you see um the year and this like we said always um will be at the beginning of of the the inscriptions but there's pretty few rare cases where some additional uh, information actually precedes the year but you expect to see this in the beginning so you have hat set and then you have the number so you have hat set and then you have 17 so this is the year 17 and then it tells you that this is um wine and then very good nefer nefer so this is very good wine and then there's um what a report of obviously there's some information missing from this broken shard but um just from that we get this information that i put here side um side by side in case somebody wants to actually compare those um different glyphs where we have um the hat set the year the number 17 this is how it's written on the formal sesh and then you have um irap for the y then you have nefer nefer which means very good and then you have the word of report which is of a preposition so the full translation would be year 17 very good wine off and then obviously some information i'm missing so those are the first two sets of information the year or the vintage and then the the product and the designation of the product where it tells you the product and sometimes extra descriptions of the product so if we go to the next um two sets of information so the third one will be place of production that um this this is the other set of information that you expect to see on the jar on 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 the wine jar so where was the wine produced so on the here i've actually included a glyph of the word uh and pair only because this is more, we see this a lot but there's other ones that we will look at but this is and this will be the water ripple and um this will be the enclosure and this is the single stroke and that's the formal search for it so and pair which means belonging to the estate of and if you actually look at this particular inscription we had um the word n here so there was information missing which the next set of information that we're missing is the place of production and so forth so um so this is um would tell us that this the particular wine is produced from the estate of so, such and such or it would tell us a growing area we see the words like kamu 
or or bah, which means a uh, basin, and then you have um, the institution, which is like empire we've seen on the top, um, or enhut, which both means a state or a temple of, and then you have en kamu, which means belonging to a vineyard, and then of such and such, also and so, and then we also have some other um, terms that you you can see, which such as pahenem, which means basin. And then you have Misha or irrigated area. You have shed, which is artificial lake. And then you have it ehu, which is marshes. And then um, another set of um, information that designates a place name that you that might that you know you might come across would be or uh, is Iter Imenet, which means the Western River. Now this one sometimes is used to um, replace uh, the institution. But in other times, it actually is used as an additional set of information, and you'll see it some, mostly on the second line of <clears throat> of the inscription. So that would be the third one, and um, I hope this is not really too dry. <laughs> but we'll we'll get to look at inscriptions uh, soon. So then we go to the last set of information, and this will tell us the ownership or the authorization. So uh, with the ownership, we'd have like the producer of the wine sometimes or and sometimes additional information of um, an official. And um, this will be kind of like a rubber stump. So an official would, um, the name of an official would be included, the title and the name. And that acts like as, a, as somebody who is like authorizing or, or authenticating or, or pretty much certifying that the that those are the contents of the jars what's what's on the on the label are the contents of the jars and they'll do that before um, the jars leave the production area so and uh, for the most part you will see uh, i've also included this one which is more generic word uh, that you can actually come across a lot on on a lot of the jar labels and this is heri kamu and um this one means the head of it now or the master of winemaking and this is the the formal search for that word and you see here that is um, the glyph for the sky, and this at the arms raised upward for the white car. And then you have the vulture, then you have the owl, then you have this is the heretic glyph for the quail chick, and then you have the pear. And sometimes you have a man here, but it has and it's not here. And then that's one of the titles that you will see a lot. Some of the other titles that you might come across will be Heripa, uh, which is supervisor or you have um, Sesh, Nesu, Royal Scribe, and a lot of other different titles as well. You probably have like Reg um, and all of that, which would be like an administrator and so forth. So I'm not going to go all over all those um, different, um, all the details, but uh, at the end of the presentation, I have um, resource, a bibliography or a reference that you could actually use to go and read, um, get further reading on that. And, and obviously, you can't, once you start translating, you you come across other titles as well. So those are the four sets of information that we, that um you that are more standard. And remember, kind of like we have the the offering formula where uh, Seba Ujao told us about how it is structured. There's a there's a way that things are structured, and so you expect to see um the beginning. You see the offering, then you see the the name of the deity, and usually at the end you would have the name of the person and then you have, the, you know, like the word like Mahakiru um, and all of that. So when you when you kind of, you, when you know the method and the structure, it gets easier. So with these kind of labels also, we have the same kind of um, structure that is followed. And so you have the four sets of information. Again, I'll just repeat them in case, you know, because it's a lot of dry information, but I'll just repeat them before we start looking at um, the inscriptions themselves. So you have the first one, which will be the year. You expect to see the year of the vintage, the vintage, and then you you expect to see um, what product, what it is, what type of wine it is, and then you expect to see a uh, place of production where was the wine produced, and then you expect to see who authorized this what um, this this wine, you know, are the jars correct? What what is in the jars? Are they correct? So you, you expect to see those four sets of information. Um, that's standard. <clears throat> So um, on this next um, slide, what we're going to look at is a full inscription that contains all those four sets of information. And uh, obviously this is facsimile, it's not a picture of the real um, <laughs> job, but this is a facsimile and um, the, you know, um, the, I believe the resource at the end of, of the 
presentation as well. So here we have, um, in the beginning, again, you expect to see the year. So here we have um, Hatsa. So this is the year and then the number. So this will be the number 10. Uh, so this would be the year 10. And then what type of wine? So we see here that this is Europe. You see the red leaf, the mouth, and then you see the mat. So this is Europe. This other sets of glyph, that's the determinacy. So that's Europe. And um, no other information um, describing that particular wine is there. The next information we see is the place of production. So we see N pair. So this is of the estate of. And then we see here um, a name, Sehotep Ra. And then on the next slide, we see um, the name of uh, the title first and then the name of the official. So we see um, Heri Kamu. Um, and let me see if I go to the other slide over here. That was um, the generic this was the generic term, uh, the one, the common term that we saw a lot for the for Harry Kamu. So this will be Harry Kamu or the master winemaker. So let me go back to where we are. And yeah, so here we have um, Harry Kamu and it goes, is this um, glyph here with the sky, uh, the arms raised, and then you have the vulture and then you have the Ridley, uh, the, the, the owl which looks like a three and then you have uh the quill chick the heretic quill chick and then you have the enclosure so that would be heavy kamu and then you have here the man holding the the stick and then you have uh with both hands and then you have um then you have the canine so you have sete so this will be the name of the the this will be the the name that goes with this title so what this inscription is telling us about this wine is that it was this is from the year 10. And then this wine is from the estate of um, Sahotepra and uh, it's authorized by um, um, the, the, the Harry Kamu uh, known as um, Satek. So, and then on this other um, inscription, let me see if I can get the cursor again. Yeah. On this other inscription, we have, um, again, it starts with a year. So we expect to see the year in the beginning here. So that will be um, HATSEP and then a numerical number. And that is the number nine. So, and then on the next line, we see, um, we expect to see the particular des designation of the product. And here we have um, the Europe, which you should be familiar with now, which is the reed leaf and the mouth and the mat, um, the jugs and the three strokes. So you have Europe. And then there's an extra detail uh, about the, the wine. So it's telling us the quality or the grade. So this will be um, Nefer and Nefer. So this is very good wine. And then uh, the place of production. So this is from the estate and pair from the estate of, and then we have a Chinook, and then the name Eaton. So we see that um, the reed leaf, we see the raised bread loaf, we see an ligature combined, uh, the raised bread loaf combined with the water ripple. Then we see the sun, and then uh, this will be the glyph for the, um, for the nature sign, which is with uh, Horus on a, on a standard pole. And then, and then the, the enclosure for the Chinook. So that would be from the estate of Eaton. And then the, we see the, at the end, we expect to see a title and a name. And this is um, the title for Rewedj, which would be similar to administrator. And then the name, which is Chu. So we see a tethering rope. And then we see the heretic um, glyph for for the quill chick and then we see the glyph for the determinative for man so you see um chu so this will be the the administrator chu so this particular um ja label contains is from the ninth year it contains very very good it's very good wine and it's from the estate of Eton or Aten, and uh it was authorized by um the administrator known as chu 
and um, lastly if we look at um, this glyph over uh, this ins inscription over here we see um, again uh, we follow the same structure so you see the 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 glyphs for the year um, so you see the palm branch over there you see the raised bread loaf and then you see the threshing floor so that will be Hatsep and then numerical number four so this will be Hatsep four or the year four and then uh, we'll see a product so this product is Irup again so this is wine and then we see a particular quality of this wine so this is a different quality so we see this is a pod and it looks like a three with a dot on it and then we have a three here, a, a glyph that looks like a three, which is the owl. So this will be for the word Najam, which means um, sweet. So this will be um, sweet wine. And then we see a place of production. And we see Enper from the estate of, and then we see Aten again, or Aten. So this will be, um, and then there's um, extra set of information here. So here we see um, what? I think most of us are familiar with, which would be Ankh, and then Weja, and then Sneb, and then the water ripple and So this first line here will be, just to go over it quickly, will be um, the year for the, the year four. Um, very uh, this is sweet wine from the estate of Aten, and then Ankh, Weja, Sneb, um, giving life, prosperity and health too, and then down here we have um extra set of information and uh, we went over that in the other slides where we talked about sometimes you have um place name an additional place name added and this will be itlu imanet so this will be the western river so giving life prosperity life uh, prosperity and health to the western river and then we have um uh here we have um the title and then the name of an official so it will be Harry Kamu, and we're kind of familiar with that. So we'll start from this this glyph of the sky, and we'll finish with the glyph of the uh, enclosure. So that would be Harry Kamu, and then the name of that particular um, um, Harry Kamu, which will be the upper Reshep or Reshepu. So those are those um, three different glyphs that we've or three different inscriptions that we looked at containing um, the four sets of information. In this one, we had um, an extra one. And like we said, sometimes you find extra information in the beginning that precedes the year, but the year usually starts. And then in between, you can have um, extra sets of information. And then sometimes you have a place name like this, Eater, Imanet, or the Western River. This sometimes replaces the institution here, um, Enper, um such of such and such or, or the estate of such and such sometimes it will replace that but if it doesn't it's used as an additional information and you usually see it on the second line for the most part so um here is just a summary of um the three different um artifacts that we've looked at or the facsimiles of those three different artifacts that we looked at so uh, just to go over those um four sets of information on each artifact on the first one, uh, when it comes to vintage, we saw that it was from, it was Hat Septen, which is um, the year 10. And on the second one, it was um, Hat Sept 9, which was the year 9. And on the third one, it was Hat Sept 4, which was on the year the year 4. So that was the vintage of that um, wine. And then on the classification, on the first one, we had um, Europe, which was wine. On the second one, we had um, we had both the type and the quality. So we had Irep and then we had Nefer Nefer. So that was very good wine. On the third artifact, what we saw was um, uh, both the type and the quality as well. So here we saw Irep and Nejem and it was very sweet wine. And then uh, on the place of production, on the first artifact, we saw that that was from um, the estate of Sahotepra. And on the second one, that was from the estate of Eaton. And then on the third one, it was from the estate of um, Eaton as well. So, and then um, on the first artifact, we didn't have any additional information. Um, on the second one, we didn't have any additional information either. But on the third one, we had um, a set of additional information. 
what we had was unquenched snap and eater imminent so giving life and prosper prosperity and help to um the western river and then on the first artifact when it came to authorization we had um that was um harry kamu satek so and then the second one um we had Bereg, Chu, which was the administrator Chu. and then on the third one we had harry kamu uh, uh master of the winemaking which was um upper reship or reship pool so those were the, those um, sets of information that we, we kind of went. And you could see, um, uh, if you looked at them, you see that there's, um, there's, um, there's, a, stand, there's a structure that is, that is followed for the most part. So, and, and even when you look at it, so if you're looking at it for the first time and you went through, let's say, those three different um, artifacts, um, I think what, what will happen is you would quickly get familiar with um, these um, different glyphs already you'd get um, familiar with the, with the glyphs for the word year, like Hatsev. And then um, you'd get uh, familiar with the glyphs for Europe and uh, the glyphs for Nefer Nefer and, and Empire and, and uh, of, let's say, Harry Kamu. And, and then obviously there's differences with the, with the numbers and then there's differences with the names. But um, you would... What, what what happens is you start to get familiar with words and which is actually good because uh, uh what we know is that um scribes or young scribes in ancient Kemet when they learned the the, the start first started learning um the simplified such middle nature and obviously they were learning them um in first using words and then combining words into phrases and then phrases into full sentences and then sentences into full inscriptions or full texts and and whatnot and that and so taking this approach you kind of use that system as well and you start to instead of trying to learn to recognize um start recognizing all these abstract single glyphs obviously it's not going to happen more for the most part because some of them are written some of them um, com they are combinations but what happens is you quickly get familiar with with, with words and you know with just um a group of of, of glyphs instead of single glyphs so which is actually quicker it seems like it's intimidating but it is actually it's not that hard once you can have a structure and you have a method and then so um over here you have an example of uh, of an inscription and this is from a broken shard so most of the time you'll find um artifacts that are not complete and then sometimes you find that they are you know they're not clear as well they are pretty much um they have a lot of damage but um, even this that has um, some damage, once we know um, we have we know the sets of information that we expect to see or that we see, then it gets it gets a little bit easier. So, um, for example, here uh, we expect to see the year to begin with. We expect to see um, a wine a mention of what particular type of wine, or perhaps even the quality, or if not, then the type of use um, of the wine, and then you expect to see from what estate or from what place it was produced from and and, and so, so forth so um over here what you have here is and they should be recognizable now you have hard step. so that would be those three glyphs again that would be the palm branch the raised bread loaf and the, the threshing flow and then the number so you have um 10 they should be familiar now it looks like an upside down v so that's the the glyph for the number 10 and then this that looks like a two, but with an elongated um, front, that's seven, and we've seen it. So this will be um, hard step 17. And then here, it might not be clear, but you already should be familiar with looking at this. This is the reed leaf. Um, this definitely looks like a mat. And um, this is um, um, a mount. So this will be Eric. And then you have... Um, the determinatives which are not very clear over here but we could ascertain that this is Europe and then here we have um this cliff it looks like a three and there's a dot on the top and then this one looks exactly like that one as well but it doesn't have that and um if you remember from this section we had a um, particular wine that had the same description and that was this is the is this cliff that looks like a three with a dot and then this other three which is the owl and this is like the part so this would be Nedjam. so over here we also have um the the place for Nedjam. 
and this describes this so this will be sweet wine and then we have our designation of the place of production so this will be n pair so this is water ripple the enclosure and the single stroke so this will be n pair and then here is not so clear but we expect to see to have a name of um you know of an estate so this will be the year 17 and this is very sweet wine and from the estate of so and so or such and such so we don't have all the information but we know that um if if you were digging and you found this um you know that this particular shard must have been of a wine uh and very sweet wine and it was from such and such a year we don't know the estate anyway but yeah so just from those simple information we have um we could definitely um translate that this particular shard and um over here i've included um what i just went through which will be the this is the formal search for it these ones are grayed out because we are not sure what you're not sure you can leave out or you could grade out if you um you know suggesting what it could be but it's not really clear so that would be Hatsa 17 Europe Nedrim and Per and then this is also put in brackets because we don't know what it is it's just a suggestion so what we know is that it's from the 17th year this is the sweet wine of the estate of somebody and pretty much that is that so what we've gone over uh, if you just summarize it is if you're reading those um wine jar labels um the standard that that is followed um for the most part will be where you see a vintage it will tell you the year and in the year you would see this clip and then you would see you would expect to see some numbers but well, in to tell you which year and then expect to see a product and uh in such some different cases we have irrep other places we have said uh shade and then you sometimes it includes um quality of that particular wine and then you see a place of production and uh, you would see um glyphs like this at this other um names that are used as well that we've gone over and then you also expect to see um these ones as well for the most part and then it the the inscription usually finishes off with the title and and name um, that shows us ownership or, or whoever authorized um, those particular um, jars. So these are the glyphs that you might see. You have um, the wedge, you have Harry Kamu, we went over, you could see Sessionesu and all other types of titles that um, it's not, you know, we, we won't have time to go over on this in inscription, uh, on this um, presentation anyway, and the inscriptions that we have. But so that pretty much is is it really so um when you have all the set of information you can go over other there's other other ones that we have i'll just go through these pictures and just post them so that if anybody's watching at a later time they could probably um attempt to to translate what we have actually this one um just to quickly go over it, a part of it this we didn't most of the ones that we translated had the designation of wine which was irrep sometimes you see something like this which is also shade and this will be the pomegranate wine so we didn't go over this but you will see this as well and then everything else pretty much um should follow that um standard formula so so that's wine. we have this one there's pretty uh, pretty much a lot and um we have also that one as well you can pause it at any time and go over it and uh and that was just pretty much to show that you know uh, getting into reading Hebraic is not really it's not it shouldn't, shouldn't be intimidating once you have a structure and you have a method you could get into translating different things that are written or different artifacts or different texts that are written in Hebraic. and pretty much um there's a lot of different labels that um that we have not just on wine on wine we have um other labels i have some pictures i think um yeah so um for example this one here this is a of a jar that contains fat it doesn't the obviously they have it, it this has its own structure as well but um you can see obviously it starts with the year as well but you can get uh into you know attempt to translate also this ones as this kind of um artifacts as well 
we have another one here and this one is a jar that contains um honey you can see here um thank you um here we have meat okay so this is of a um jar that contains um honey and those are not so difficult as well so once you kind of learn uh, or you you go through certain inscriptions like the one we went over then you know it'd, it'd be much easier to go over this there's um, another one and this one contains um meat and i think this one is useful for festivities as well and this one starts with a year as well and obviously they have um their own um um standard way that they, they use and so it's just to show that there's a lot to trans that we can translate um this um on, on using this uh this particular script as well and once you um you you learn the, the you know the method and have a structure then it's really not that that difficult and that's pretty much it but um so these are the references that i i used and i just wanted to go over this one in particular i would definitely recommend that um that um you get a hold of this particular paper this is by um evelina Wolberg, and she did a very thorough job on on the on the wine jar labels and that pretty much that was the inspiration behind um the um, this presentation so that's a really good paper there's a lot of information that i would not be able to go through uh in this um presentation so i would suggest that and definitely recommend that uh you get a hold of that and you go and you read it some of the um, the the facsimiles that i showed were coming from this particular book and and this one this one is uh, specifically dedicated to the inscriptions, the heretic inscriptions that are found on the tomb of Tut Ankhamun, and they include not just the wine jars but other artifacts as well. Uh, this one has um, a lot of artifacts. Doesn't really say much, but I, I believe there's a there's a chapter um, that uh, was written by Griffith, and which kind of explains some of the things, some of the um, the some details on the on the pictures that are contained in this um, in this book. There's a lot, um, not just wine, there's also um, different oils, um, honey, all of that. So that's a good one too to get a hold of. Um, this particular book pretty much just goes over the translations and the uh, picture. So, but that's a good one to go over. And um, when when um, translating Heretic, I was, um, a good suggestion would be to get hold of Muller's um, books. And this one is because they would kind of you be part, most of the time using them as your dictionary um, to get to know the different glyphs, um, the heretic glyphs that you can't most. It will be kind of difficult to get another dictionaries. So that's a that would be recommended. So that's pretty much it. And these are just um, uh, if you would like to look at the images that are included on the on this um, presentation, then these are the links. So that is pretty much it. Okay, <laughs> well, um, that was excellent. I mean, it can excellent, excellent, excellent. I think everyone will agree. Um, I have I was checking out the the chat while you were um, giving the information just to keep up and see if there was any questions, but there aren't that many questions. But let me um, say that if you do have questions, make sure you do uh, type them in. Um, I didn't see any questions. Um, I saw just a couple, but and we, we can go over that but um you know that was a very thorough job and and I, and I don't think there was questions because it was such a thorough job you know um of what you presented and showed and that's really 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 good and um what I wanted to say is um this what you just did is also good now this is you know in terms of suggestions or advice to people who are learning uh Rani Kemet and Sesh Metal Nature um as as I always say that it's always good when you're practicing your transliterations and translations to pick a genre of text. And so you may have heard me say before, um, let's say you just collect all of the offering formulas that you can collect, you know, similar to the one that, that we read at the beginning. If you do that, then one, you'll be practicing your transliterations, which you'll get used to um, the manual decodage or the diacritic uh, transliteration systems. You'll be used to the writing system, etc. 
But then you'll also get used to a certain set of vocabulary words that are repeated and redundant. You know, uh, like Hotep Dinasu, you'll, you'll, and you'll start to see a structure with that particular type of inscription. So what um, you showed tonight is the same thing, but with wine labels, where there's a, a, a pattern, a structure there, and then there's going to be a set of vocabulary that people will automatically get used to. And so by, by choosing a genre of text and sticking to it until you become proficient is an excellent way to um, learn and then learn in a structured format. So you learn the offering formulas, you stick with that for a while. You, learn, you may want to deal with wine labeling, stick with that for a while. You may want to deal with um, the Raul Neu Peret in Heru, the Books of the Dead. You may want to pick um, a chapter out of different ones and stick to that. And you're going to see that these texts have a certain set of vocabulary. And so that's how you could build up your vocabulary. You could build up your pattern recognition of words. So on site, you'll be able to see what these words are and what they mean. Like, for example, the, the picture that we still have up here at uh, the beginning. If you do this enough, you'll know that the first word is always pretty much going to be Hatsep. And you recognize it. Hatsep, Hatsep, Hatsep. Every single time. Because it's going to be repeated. So those, those are the things that I noticed um, that this also provides uh, for. And so, um, yeah, so are you, are you, you want to take uh, questions and, and everything? I'll, I'll read them. Uh, I can read them. Yeah, um, sure. I'm going to, I'm going to back up a little bit uh, to the beginning. There weren't, like I said, <clears throat> there weren't too many, but uh, let me scroll up actually. But yeah, that was, that was excellent. And, uh, and let's see. Do I? I'm sure everyone will agree. Okay, so I'm going all the way to the top. Uh, you know, again, you know, I want to say uh, ETM Hotel, welcome to everyone. You know, I appreciate it. Um, everyone tuned in uh, for this. And let's see. Um, and shout out to everyone in the chat. Okay. Um, there's someone named Egypt. They're asking a question that's on a different subject. So I'm going to skip that one. But I, I, I'll check into that just to let them know if they're still listening. Um, I've, I've, Dwa. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm butchering the pronunciation of the name, but it's uh, A V W D H A twice. Um, it says Hotep, a great god. A great god should be spelled with a capital G. If that is a problem, let us settle for Netra because the two stand for each other. Okay, I'm I'm assuming that was when I was reading the um, offering formula. I do want to make a comment about that. The uh, orthographic rules of English does not apply to Sesh Medunetra. So I want to make that very clear. The orthographic rules, which is the rules of capitalization and et cetera for English, does not apply to Sesh Medunetra. We only do that to convey it in the target language, which would be English for us. So... Um, some scholars will not capitalize the G on the word God for this reason, because when you do, some people will mistake it for the normal uh, rules of capitalization for the God of the Abrahamic belief systems. And so people will equate that G, capital G-O-D God with the Abrahamic conceptualization of God. And it's not the same. So they just spell it regularly with a lower g to kind of help the mind not do that so just just so people will understand so some scholars will do it and some scholars won't all right so it's not really um something that's you know not not something that's uh sticks out should stick out all right um so let me go down okay so that lisa says it seems redundant to have two nefers and three strokes. Um, I'm assuming when, when you went over the um, nefer, nefer, and there were three strokes there. You have any comments on that? Oh, okay. Um, was it that um, it would rather be just nefer, nefer, or, or nefer with the three strokes? No, she, what she said is that it seems redundant to have two nefers and three strokes. 
um no i don't think it would be because um if we learn about how um nouns um and when you're talking about nouns and numbers or, or quantity the work then sometimes um you would have the glyphs it's the glyphs themselves um if you're plural plural pluralizing or or making it dual um and i think this you could go over this on on in grammar is uh you would probably have um the the, the glyphs or the nouns that uh, they would either double them or triple them or sometimes the determinatives would, would would they would put the determinatives over the three stroke or sometimes even just both so that's just um the way this the scribe might choose to 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 do that okay but we see that a lot you know uh, especially when you're making when you put uh, dualizing or pluralizing things okay and also son at lisa it's a simple way of having an adverb all right so an adjective if i want to say great or if i want to say big and then i want to say very big very is an adverb that that is modifying the adjective big so very big so in the grammar of the language if you have nefer neferu it's an adverb to an adjective it's very good all right so to move it forward let's see um to keep going okay sister uh Ju Ju julanda or uh julan landa <laughs> i probably put her in the name julanda <laughs> um I could tell that she loves wine. <laughs> she made that clear in the uh, on the you know the announcement of the Facebook post and everything. So I'm sure she's attentive to this presentation. But um, and that's good because if you love wine, you like wine. Um, I now I know a, a few people who are very into wines, and and I'm not. I've never been into wines. It it wasn't even until recently that I learned that Moscato and Merlot were actually names of grapes. I didn't even know that. So, you know, that tells you, you know, what kind of wine drinker I am. But um, so, yeah, if you're into wines, this will be this will be a, a more of an incentive and help you actually learn the language because you like wine. And then, you, you know, and, and you know about wines, then you're going to be interested in studying how the ancient uh, Remich did it. And they're identical. Like what you pointed out, uh, Emiket, like, um, I don't know. Can you pull up your can you keep your, your presentation up? So. Because I, I want um, you to um, revisit a couple of the slides. If you can pull it back up. All right, I'll do that. Um. Yeah, um, if you can go to the slide where you had the modern, um, you had the modern wine bottle. Okay. So... And see, this is very interesting. You know, this is something that that's interesting and, and it needs to kind of be underscored or emphasized that that the way that we label wine bottles today is the same as the ancient Kemetiu uh, or the ancient Remage did thousands of years ago. And that's very, very interesting that 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 that's been kept up. Um, so I thought that was very, very interesting right there. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Pretty much the only thing they didn't probably have is a supermarket because their, their products were pretty, you know, labeled, checked and all. So, you know, just with the wine, but you can see it's a lot. So that that's actually very interesting to note that, you know, you walk in a supermarket aisle and you're looking at all these things labeled nicely and you know where to get and what to look for if you're logic or something. And all that was pretty much done in ancient, you know, in Kemet. Okay, yeah. So I wanted to um, reiterate that that was that's very interesting, and um, and I didn't know that. So th this sparks an interest for me because you know there's a lot of things that we do today that we've done for thousands of years. We just don't realize it until we come across it. So this is one of those things. Um, let's see. I'm just going down the, down the the chat again. Okay, uh, the user uh, Egypt um, is asking about. What do you think about the first sentence in the new book by PYR? I'm not sure who that is. Uh, it talks about secret metonetric codes never seen before. Okay. So because that's off topic, you know, we'll deal with that another time, but I will look into that. Um, so let's go on. It says, uh, 
Okay, now we're getting a suggestion on another presentation, which is on Pharaonic wigs uh, from um, Avdwa. Um, on Pharaonic wigs. So we. That's a suggestion. So, uh, Amy Cat, I don't know if you want to uh, tackle that uh, at a future date. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I had an interest on wine labels. <laughs> I've always kind of um, been intrigued with wine labels. <laughs> so, okay. okay, that was more interesting. But somebody might take something on wigs. <laughs> all right, on wigs. Well, you know, all right. Um, that'd be that's a good suggestion, Dua, for that. Um, I believe that's um, Sunet, uh, Sunet Waret, uh Comfort. That's um, that suggested that. Um, so uh, Hotep, uh, sign up with that uh, comfort. Okay, to keep going. Um, okay, Christopher Withers says, is this an old kingdom way of writing nefer, uh, nefer we? Um, no, you, no, you had to check uh, that it's an um, adverbial uh, structure, which, you know, kind of gets into the details of grammar. And, you know, we're going to start bringing up more grammar points and, and grammatical features of the language um you know because a lot of people are you know becoming competent in the beginner's level of the language and the more and more people that do that then we can move on into raising grammatical issues which would be very very good and it'll show progress um you know like my my one of my goals is to raise an army of scribes People who are competent and proficient in the language because it's only through the language will we ever uh, get a better understanding of Kemet. No matter what anybody else says, if people are trying to study Kemet, talk about Kemet, teach about Kemet, and even practice some, some of the traditions from Kemet, if they're not going through the language, then you're handicapping yourself. It's just that simple. So by raising an army of scribes, it becomes the the um, opening, the opening of the way, the door, the sebket, the gate for all things on the other side, which will be the benefits of um, the sciences and the traditions and the genius that is um, contained in the Nile Valley. All right. Um, but outside of that, I don't see any other. Um, other questions so mk that you did an excellent job i mean anytime you do, you do a presentation and then and then everybody's quiet <laughs> on the on the questions then that's you know the assumption is that everybody understands and um and that was that was excellent so so um excellent job with that and i hope everyone benefits from that uh from this yeah. and, and pass it on and, and share it um share it uh to to people because what this does it one it teaches you about the wine labeling itself but it also teaches you that learning um simplified sesh metal nature which they call heretic is not intimidating um so that emmy cat showed that she made it look easy and um and it just shows that that it could be done you know um but i'm gonna ask you a question how long have you been studying um, Sesh Meta Natural or the language or the writing system, period. Like, how long have you been studying? When did you start? Oh, um, I started with your class. <laughs> and when was that? Um, is it two years? Okay, two years ago? I think, yeah, two years ago. And I started knowing nothing. I didn't even know the Mono Little Wolves. Okay, all right. So uh, I, I asked that because, you know, people you know to address the thing about intimidation i you know there's people who feel intimidated they don't want to learn um because they think it's hard or it takes you know it's some rocket science and it's, and it's really not it's just if if people can replace the the perception of it being hard with just a perception of it being different that's it the the writing system and the way it maps to the language is just different than how we do english that's it. And differences should not be intimidating at all. You just learn it. That's it. It's not it's not hard at all. It's just different. And it takes a little bit of a different approach in learning it. You cannot you can't learn 
um, Rodney Kim and, and Sesh Metal Nature the same way we would learn a second language such as Spanish or French. Because in, in a Spanish class, you have a Spanish teacher. We already have living um, communities of Spanish speakers that we can hear the language spoken at all times. And so there's a leniency towards a method of um, of a direct approach to learning Spanish or French because they could say a word, they could point to the object, they could point to a house, they could say casa, and so on. Um, when it comes to uh, quote unquote dead languages, you can't use that approach. The approach is is different because you're learning the language through your eyes, through reading, not through your ears and hearing. So that's the main difference. You either learn it through your, through hearing it or you're learning it through seeing it. And in seeing it, you have to be a lot more technical because you have to know how is the writing system mapped to the language. And so this approach is different. And that's that's all it is. It's just different, not hard. It's just different. But um, I don't see any more questions. So, I mean, you have anything else you you uh, anything else for us? <laughs> no, no, not really. Oh, and um, yeah, since um, Senator Lisa was asking about the nefer, <laughs> the nefer, uh, I just, it just um, I just uh, thought about it, and actually, um, uh, you know how different products or, or services are always given like five stars, three stars, four stars. So I thought about the the word nefer that we see a lot because some of those ja, ja labels, I, I didn't. I didn't show some of them over here, but you can find them. Um, it's very rare, though. They have like um, very, very, very good wine or something like that. Which, or even makeup, they would have like. I think it's mostly with makeup. You'd find um, very, very, very good description. So kind of look at the word "nefer" as the start. So it could be sometimes it's not there, so it's just regular, and then you have one "nefer" which would be good. And then you have two nerfers that you like good, very good. And then you have three where it's like, you know, extra, extra. That's like a five star. <laughs> so that's also something that I think is very interesting to note. Mm. That that would be kind of like a way of grading the different levels of the quality of the products. All right. I just wanted to read that because I didn't say that before. Um, I would say as a side note, um, this may um, ins inspire someone to read the story about Sekhmet and how the story of Ra, <clears throat> Ra sends his daughter, the daughter of Ra, Sekhmet, to uh, quelch a disturbance. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving a very brief summary uh, paraphrasing of the story. But there's a myth of Ra sending Sekhmet to um, handle noise that the people are making and disturbing him. And so he sends her to handle the handle business and she kills the people that are responsible for the disturbance. But then she gets bloodthirsty and starts killing innocent people. And then Ra has to devise a plan to trick her and to be, let her become intoxicated. So he changed the blood into wine and uh, she became drunk, passed out and then woke up and she was calmed down. And then she goes back to him and everything's back to normal. You know, I'm, I'm giving a very, very brief <laughs> cliff note version of that story. But there's a myth of Ra and um, Sekhmet and Het Heru, et cetera, et cetera. So look into that and read that and you'll, you'll see it's interesting um, about wine and the effects of wine, the intoxicating effects of wine and things. And there's something else about that story, but that's for another show. Um, but, yeah, check that out um, to see, you know, what else th that wine was used for or the the views of wine in terms of that and that must have been some very good wine that she had <laughs> so probably never 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 uh on that wine 10 stars but uh so with that um i don't want to make this video too long because it was a nice presentation it's nice and concise so we want to um, keep the video bite sized where people will enjoy and watch the whole video because we have a tendency to go very long so um i do want to say and end this off with um, if you want to learn uh, Sesh Metal Nature and Ronnie Kimmett, we have beginners classes that are hosted at SaberUniversity.com, which is the website on the right hand side, uh, SaberUniversity.com. You can sign up at any time. The course is designed to go at your own pace. There's a textbook that goes with the course. 
So it's not just a course where you just watch videos and then that's it. There's an actual textbook that comes with the course uh, included in the price. Or if you already have the textbook, um, which is this book here, let me actually show that as well. Uh, it's the book on the left hand side, A Beginner's Introduction to Metal Nature. That is the textbook for the course. Um, if you already have the book, there's no problem because the course will be discounted. Then you'll just be paying for the course. But the course is designed where you can go at your own pace and you'll have access to a live instructor um, several times a week. We're building it up to where we have live sessions several times a week and you can come into the live session and get any question answered on any portion of the book that you're at. So there's eight chapters in the book and you can walk yourself through the chapters and you come into the sessions. If you're on chapter one, then you can ask your questions about chapter one. If you're on chapter two, you can ask your questions on chapter two. And then it's a learning environment for everyone. So every student will learn from each other's questions and the answers given, et cetera. It's a nice environment. And we have these two hour sessions and we wanna build them up to where we have them several times a week at different times which will accommodate everyone's uh, schedule. You know, everyone has a livelihood and have to live and work and everything. So we, we, we want to um, accommodate for all of that. And this is the better approach than the system that we had set up before. It was very difficult for me to um, accommodate people's free time and to build a class group. So, so we've changed it up and now we have an open class where anyone who's ever... Um, signed up or registered for the class can come in whether you signed up two years ago a year ago you 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 know like for example emmy Kett, you said two years ago you started you're welcome in the in the sessions um because people may need a refresher all right so just to give an idea about that second on the left hand side we have um the session metal nature uh, website itself which is the home of the Seshumani Meta Nature. And on that site, we have transliterations, translations, uh, articles. We're addressing different uh, misinformation. Um, we have uh, resources on the website. And just to keep up with what we have going on, go to that website. Register to, the, to these websites. And there's a premium membership on Sesh Meta Nature website where you get access to the what we call the Per Majat, which is the digital library. All right, and you have access to resources. So we have dictionaries, we have um, facsimiles, we have books that, um, you know, in, in a, a downloadable format where you can get a lot of different resources there. All right, um, and we'll keep up, we always update that as well. All right, so with that, I hope you all have enjoyed the presentation. Um, I, uh, again, Emmy Cat, that was an excellent, excellent, excellent job. And, um, Look out for our next uh, presentation and look out for our other shows. And with that, I will say Shimon Hotep.